Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm just going to go over a very quick overview of uh, everything that we went over last time in this Chapter 2, Part 3 lecture. Uh, so remember from last time we talked about the two major different types of cells in the body, the germline, or uh, specifically referred to as germ cells, and then the somatic cells. Right, The somatic cells represent the overwhelming majority of cells in your body. Uh, the germ cells of the germline are located within the gonads. Uh, We then talked about uh, the different types of cell divisions that were characteristic of these two very different types of cell populations. We said that in germ cells, um, uh, we see a division strategy known as meiosis. And then in somatic cells, we see a division strategy known as mitosis. All right, so that meiosis occurs in germ cells and mitosis occurs in somatic cells. All right, we also went over uh, the terms of diploid versus haploid. We looked at uh, diploid karyotypes and compared them and contrasted them to haploid karyotypes. And then we talked about this type of cell division that is characteristic in our trillions and trillions of somatic cells. That is mitosis. We looked at the basic purpose of mitosis is to facilitate uh, growth, differentiation, and regeneration of our cells. And then we said that all cells that are actively dividing are actually uh, contained within what is known as a cell cycle, specifically is referred to as a mitotic cell cycle. And we took a big picture overview of this mitotic cell cycle, looking at a very primitive uh, version of a cell that did not have a nucleus and only had one chromosome. Now in reality, uh, our cells would have nuclei and the chromosomes would be within those nuclei and we would have 46 different chromosomes of which there are 23 different types of chromosomes, each with uh, homologous pairs of chromosomes within their ranks. Uh, however, for the sake of simplicity, the cell that we showed did not have a nucleus and it just had a single chromosome. All right, and so we looked at this uh, cell in interphase where the uh, chromosome is all spread out in uh, the unwound version of um, the chromosome known as chromatin. And we looked at it during the first phase of mitosis, which is called G1, the longest phase of, um, or I'm sorry, not, not the first phase of mitosis, but the, the first phase um, of interphase of the mitotic cell cycle um, interphase is the uh, component of the mitotic cell cycle where the cell is not actively dividing. So we looked at G1, the first component of interphase, and then we looked at S phase, where this um, single copy of one chromosome is duplicated at multiple origins of replication, which eventually all merge into one another to yield two identical copies of the same unique chromosome. All right, and once those two identical copies of the same unique chromosome have been formed, we are now in G2 phase. Notice that in G2 phase, um, the chromosomes are still on the unwound form. Now we enter in uh, the smallest component of the mitotic cell cycle, the actual component or phase where we see uh, active cell division occurring. This is of course known as mitosis, all right? And then in mitosis, what happens is, is these two identical uh, copies of the same chromosome both start to wind and wind and wind and wind and wind some more. And then both individual uh, copies, these, oh, both of these, uh, we're trying to, trying to use my pen tool here. Maybe, oh, oh, that's right. I have to specify that I want to use the pen tool. There we go. All right. So we say we have two identical copies here of the same chromosome. All right, and we have two identical copies of the same chromosome because they were replicated during S phase of interphase. And going forward, as we enter mitosis, uh, both of these two identical replicate copies of the same chromosome 
uh, undergo a process known as chromosome condensation. This is where we go from the loose unwound form of uh, the chromosome known as chromatin to the dense organized version, all right, uh, which we characteristically recognize as the X-shaped chromosome, aka the bivalent chromosome, all right? Many textbooks, by the way, when they're referring to chromosomes or when they use the word chromosome, they're talking about the highly compact uh, condensed version. All right. So both of these replicate copies are undergoing the process of chromosome condensation. All right. And each of the replicate copies will end up becoming individual sister chromatids within the same bivalent chromosome where each individual sister chromatid is a 100% identical copy of the other. Then we go through a process known as chromosome segregation where the sister chromatids are pulled away from one another and magically beginning immediately after the two sister chromatids of the bivalent chromosome are pulled away from one another, these sister chromatids have brand new names. Do you remember what those are called? Or what they are called after uh, they're broken apart? That's right, they're called daughter chromosomes. And then finally, the cytoplasm of the cell uh, divides itself. So now we have two completely independent uh, albeit genetically identical cells, each with a single daughter chromosome in it. And if you recall, because each of these sister chromatids way back when, when we had a bivalent chromosome represent only one um, identical copy of the, um, of the DNA of the chromosome, when they break apart, when the sister chromatids break apart into daughter chromosomes, those resulting daughter chromosomes will only have one copy of the DNA for that particular chromosome. So then after, as we go uh, uh, enter back into interphase, all right, these daughter chromosomes will unwind and unwind and unwind, or in other words, decondense back into the unwound chromosome form. And we're right back at G1 phase of interphase for one of these particular cells. And then the other particular cell will also go into G1 of interface. All right. I know I'm going a lot faster because we're just reviewing these concepts. Um, if this is still um, cloudy for you, it just means that you need to go back um, to the first uh, chapter uh, two, part three lecture, segment one, and, and look at it again or a couple more times or, or come in and see me. All right, so uh, we also touched upon uh, uh, the specifics of chromosome condensation. All right, and we looked at two different diagrams to help us um, uh, graphically internalize these concepts. This is our second graphic showing this process of chromosome condensation. Along the way, we also reviewed some basics about uh, the structures of DNA. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some very specific aspects of mitosis. Uh, for diagrammatic purposes, this slide shows the mitotic cell cycle predominated with mitosis. However, keep in mind, as was exhibited in our previous uh, pie chart or wheel diagram, uh, this is not realistic as far as the actual time frame of a typical mitotic cell. The majority of the somatic cell's time during the mitotic cell cycle is spent in interphase. So like all somatic cells, the cell shown in this diagram possesses a diploid or 2N state. For each type of chromosome, there is a homologous set or pair of chromosomes. In addition, it is important to realize that the number of different types of chromosomes for this particular cell has been decreased to two instead of the 23 different types of chromosomes that the humans possess. 
Therefore, this cell possesses two sets or pairs of homologous chromosomes. All right. Recall that within a set or pair of homologous chromosomes, one homologous chromosome was inherited from the mother, and then the other homologous chromosome was inherited from the father. In this diagram, the homologous chromosome inherited from the mother is white, and the homologous chromosome inherited from the father is blue. The different types of chromosomes are signified by their different lengths. Okay? Following the numbering convention of autosomes, we will call the longer homologous pair of chromosome uh, chromosome 1 and the shorter homologous pair of chromosomes chromosome number 2. So uh, that's just a big overview. Uh, I know it's coming at you a little bit fast, but uh, I'm going to go back and uh, reiterate um, those uh, specifics that we have uh, outlined. Um, however, I just wanted to go over those basic parameters with you just because for, for those of you who have um, the writing component or my notes component right in front of you, it might um, help uh, to have the visual um, and the auditory at the same time. So now let's go over it uh, with the specifics. All right. So uh, uh, we start uh, the story in uh, G1 of interface. Uh, the chromosomes are, are decondensed, rather. They exist in the form known as chromatin. All right. Uh, then we progress into S phase. All right. And if you remember what happens in S phase. Okay. In S phase, an exact duplicate copy of each homologous chromosome is synthesized. All right. So remember, we have a total of 46 chromosomes in which we have 23 different types of chromosomes. And for each type of chromosome, we have a pair of homologous chromosomes. Well, each of those homologous chromosomes get replicated during S phase. Okay, so in other words, all 46 chromosomes are replicated in S phase. All right, so after that replication process occurs, we now have a whole bunch of chromatin, all right, within which there are two copies of each of the 46 chromosomes. And those two copies of each of the 46 chromosomes are identical to one another. So here we are in G2, uh, and uh, G2 is basically the process where the, uh, the mechanics of facilitating mitosis are starting to be um, uh, initiated and all the molecular uh, mechanisms are being wrapped up. So now we go right into the onset of mitosis, and the first phase of mitosis is known as prophase. So in prophase, the chromosomes within the nucleus begin to condense. As you can see here, we're going from the chromatin form, all right, which is all the, the loose, unwound uh, chromosomes. And uh, those chromosomes, um, or the DNA of those chromosomes, are starting to wind upon themselves. And those coils are spar starting to coil upon themselves. And those coils are starting to coil upon themselves to give you this uh, X-shaped or bivalent uh, chromosome uh, form that we are all familiar with. All right. Remember that uh, each of those two identical copies of the DNA for each chromosome manifests itself as being one of each identical sister chromatids within each of the single 46 chromosomes. All right, so that the DNA within the sister chromatids is absolutely 100% identical. Again, we have reiterated this over and over and over again. Um, and if you, if you already understand uh, these concepts, I apologize. But for everybody else who's still trying to, to grasp on to the logic here, um, again, I do it just because um, I want you to start um, uh, disciplining yourself. Uh, to, to use the same type of strategy in your studying that I'm trying to employ in my teaching. All right, and as of always, um, you know, uh, 
if it continues to confuse you, that's perfectly okay. Uh, just come on in and see me uh, as soon as we can so we can go over the basic organization of the genome. So also during uh, prophase, these two uh, centrioles, okay, which um, your textbook refers to as centrosomes, separate and migrate to opposite poles or sides of the cell. When we refer to um, different poles of the cell, all that we're saying is just different sides of the cell. All right. So as this occurs, microtubules that compose the mitotic spindle will begin to radiate out from the centrioles, or as the book refers to them as centrosomes. So coming out of these centrioles, we're going to see microtubules, and we're going to go over shortly exactly what microtubules are. All right, they, as they begin to migrate to opposite poles of the cell, you start to see the microtubules of what will become a, an elaborate network of microtubules known as the mitotic spindle. All right. So as a quick little review here, um, microtubules are fibers of the cytoskeleton. They are composed of a tiny protein subunit called tubulin. The tubulin subunits can be added to and subtracted from these fibers, allowing the microtubules to grow longer or shrink. All right, so um, I hope everybody remembers from general biology or maybe even the introductory portion of anatomy and physiology that microtubules are one of three major categories of um, fibers or filaments within the cytoskeleton of the cell. All right, and uh, and they're made up of these little subunits called tubulin, all right? And the tubulin subunits can be added to one another, like so, allowing these microtubule fibers to radiate outwards. Or, let's see, let's do the, I guess with this particular, um, in PowerPoint, I have to go specifically to the eraser. Whereas if I'm not using PowerPoint, the Wacom board will actually automatically create an eraser for me. So I'm still getting used to the technicalities of this. Okay, so just as you can add these tubulin subunits to microtubules, you can also subtract them away. In this regard, the microtubules can grow outwards and become longer, and then they can also uh, deconstruct themselves. All right, so the mitotic spindle is a structure composed of an array of microtubules that emanate outwards from the centrioles, okay, which, as you remember, are located at the opposite poles of the dividing cell. The microtubules of the mitotic spindle progressively increase their lengths and reach out uh, towards the center of the cell. Okay, uh, this is the location, by the way, the central location of the cell is where the chromosomes are going to be coming together or congregating. All right, so now that we've outlined that, oh, I got to get rid of the eraser. We'll go back to the, to the pen tool. So um, as that process completes, all right, uh, we now move into a uh, phase of mitosis known as prometaphase, all right? And so prometaphase begins as the nuclear envelope begins to disintegrate. And I think that I, I misspoke just a few lines before and when I said as this process completes. And the truth of the matter is this chromosome condensation and the movement of the centrioles and the radiation and emanation of the microtubules from those centrioles to create the uh, mitotic spindle, none of that actually ends as we progress through prometaphase. What distinguishes prometaphase from prophase is that in prometaphase, this nuclear envelope begins to break down, all right? And as this nuclear envelope begins to break down, these microtubules 
of the mitotic spindle are allowed to reach out towards and grab the different chromosomes. All right. And what's going to happen is, is microtubules from each centriole are going to reach out and eventually grab the chromosomes, okay, from each side, from each pole of the cell at each kinetochore of each chromosome, all right? So that is the process that is beginning and uh, uh, working its way towards completion during prometaphase. All right. And so here we see this process um, uh, occurring for uh, the female uh, homologous chromosome for chromosome number one, or the, the chromosome of homologous chromosome of chromosome number one of female origin, and the process also continues in the same way for the homologous chromosome um, of paternal origin um, from uh, of chromosome number one. And then over here, we see the same thing happening, okay? These microtubules from each central reaching out and grabbing uh, the uh, chromosome number two, in this case, this is the homologous chromosome of paternal origin. And then the, here's the microtubules reaching out and grabbing the um, chromosome number two, um, the homologous chromosome of chromosome number two of maternal origin. All right. All right. And uh, as we end prometaphase, that process uh, uh, will be complete of the mitotic spindle, the microtubules of the mitotic spindle um, that is reaching out and grabbing the kinetic cores of these chromosomes. At the same time, other, and actually let me change the color to show you that there are other microtubules of the mitotic spindle. Uh, let's go crazy and choose green. There are other microtubules of the mitotic spindle that do not attach to these kinetic cores. They just continue to go to the opposite poles of the cell. All right. And it's interesting that one thing that I didn't tell you that it is significant in the biomechanics of this entire process is as the microtubules uh, attach themselves, or some of the microtubules attach themselves to the kinetic cores of these different chromosomes, they then stop growing. They stay the same length. But that's not the case for these microtubules of the mitotic spindle that do not attach to chromosomes. They just keep on growing and growing and growing, and they grow so far that they start pushing against the opposite sides of the cell. So what's going to happen as a result of the mitotic spindle, or the mitot or microtubules rather, that are attached to the chromosomes staying the same length, but these other microtubules continue to push forward and forward and further, or, no, further and further and further, what's going to happen is, is uh, these chromosomes that are attached to microtubules are, end, are going to end up being yanked into the center of the cell by those microtubules. All right, and so this mitotic spindle ends up creating a natural means of lining up all 46 chromosomes. In this case, remember, we only have two chromosomes. Let me just change the color here to make it clear. So right here, we have homologous chromosomes within chromosome number one, okay? Where is our cursor? There it is. And then right here, we have the two um, 
Oh, actually, you know what? This is messed up. Ah, dumb of me. Let's see. Let's do the eraser. I'm getting confused by the by which chromosome is which based on their lengths because they look so similar in length in this diagram. All right, let's do this again. Um, pointer options, ink color. Purple. All right. So you can see on opposite sides right here, this is the female homologous chromosome of chromosome number one. And then this is the male uh, homologous chromosome of chromosome number one. Both together, they are both the type of chromosome that they are is characterized as number one. We call them number one because they are the longest in length. And that's the basic uh, naming scheme of the autosomes. And then so let's switch colors now so that I can highlight for you uh, the two homologous chromosomes of chromosome number two. And we said we were going to do these in orange. Okay, so here we have the two homologous chromosomes of chromosome number two. This is the one of maternal origin, or as I said, the female homologous chromosome, and this is the one of paternal origin, or as I previously stated, the male homologous chromosome. So all of them are all lined up tail to tail. All right. And, um, and this is because of the tension uh, that is being applied to all of them, which is equal from equal sides of um, uh, the mitotic uh, uh, spindle, uh, which is being uh, formed uh, from either pole of the cell. All right. So, uh, again, keep in mind that it is necessary for the nucleus to disintegrate it, or to s disintegrate rather, so that the microtubules can attach to the kinetic cores of the chromosomes in the first place. All right, so none of this would have been possible if not for the disintegration of the, um, of, of the nuclear envelope, okay, or nuclear membrane within prometaphase. Let's go back to red as our pointer color. All righty. So uh, a way to think about metaphase, um, as I have listed in uh, your PowerPoint notes, is you can think about um, the plate, or, or the line, rather, in which all of these chromosomes of each type line up all 46 of them okay is you can think about it as um, as a large dish that separates the two halves of the cell okay the chromosomes assume an orderly place upon this dish due to the equal and opposite pulling forces being exerted on them by the microtubules attached to their kinetic cores I already had the color that I wanted. Never mind. Okay, so it's this equal and opposite pulling forces by the microtubules that are attached to the kinetic cores of these 46 different chromosomes, all right, which is causing them ultimately to be all lined up together like this, all right? And we call this arrangement, okay, or this dish in which they are all lined up, okay, the uh, metaphase plate. I know the book calls it the equatorial plane, but um, uh, I usually refer to it as the, the metaphase plate. All right.
All right. One way to also think about this is that it may be helpful to think about this process as being a tug of war. So during metaphase, the two teams on either side, okay, being the centrials, the two teams on the either side of the rope are pulling equally. Therefore, the center of the rope, you know how in a tug of war you have like that little um, ribbon that marks the center of the rope? Uh, that center of the rope is lined up equally between the two teams. All right. It's also worth noting uh, that the chromosomes have reached their maximum condensation at metaphase. They are as coiled and condensed as possible. So remember what I said, that this process of chromosome condensation, okay, where uh, the coils are coiling further and further and further and further and further, does not end at prophase, and it does not even end at prometaphase. Uh, it's finally complete instead at metaphase. All right, so it's a lot of coiling, a lot of uh, condensation that's going on throughout uh, these first three phases. All right. One helpful way of thinking about metaphase is considering that the suffix meta means to come together. So at the metaphase plate, the chromosomes come together. All right. And uh, again, as we uh, mentioned it previously in our big overview, um, uh, when the chromosomes all come together at the metaphase plate, all right, this is generally referred to as congregation. Congregation. So you think about sometimes uh, churches are referred to as congregations because they're places where people come together. Uh, regularly, or Congress. The word Congress uh, comes from uh, this word uh, congregation because people from disparate parts of the country come together to work together um, uh, in Congress. All right. All right, so anaphase begins uh, when the sister chromatids of each chromosome, all 46, centered at the metaphase plate, suddenly break apart. So why does this happen? Why do these sister chromatids, which are connected at their centers by kinetic pores, why do they suddenly break apart? Well, the equally and opposite pulling forces from the microtubules attached to the kinetic cores of the chromosomes become so strong that the sister chromatids can no longer stay held together. The sister chromatids break apart at the kinetic cores holding them together, okay? So as soon as the sister chromatids of each of the 46 bivalent chromosomes are separated, they are each individually named as daughter chromosomes, okay? So right here we have a daughter chromosome, okay? This is of paternal origin chromosome number one, okay? Here we have a daughter chromosome, which is maternal origin chromosome number one. Here we have chromosome number two, paternal origin. It is a daughter chromosome as well. And here we have daughter chromosome number two of maternal origin. And then the exact same thing is true over here. Here we have chromosome number one. And actually, specifically speaking, it's daughter chromosome number one of paternal origin, and here we have daughter chromosome number one of maternal origin, and here we have daughter chromosome number two of paternal origin, and then we have daughter chromosome number two of maternal origin. All right, so you can see now that we have identical setups and structures of chromosomes on either side of the cell already. All right. So again, each or each of what was a sister chromatid in the bivalent chromosomes that lined up at the metaphase plate are now referred to each as being separate daughter chromosomes after anaphase has occurred. All right. So um, why is it that now we uh, 
give a new name for sister chromatids when anaphase occurs. Why is it that the sister chromatids are now henceforth known as daughter chromosomes? Why is that? Well, you don't have to think about it uh, uh, too intensely because the reason that they change names is because we say so. Remember, these are just names. At first, the naming scheme may seem confusing, but is simply meant to create a common set of terms so that people can better communicate with each other. All right, so it's something that you just kind of have to commit to memory, make sure you have committed it to memory, and move on so it doesn't act as a source of confusion as time moves on. All right, so now let's go to telophase. In telophase, the two daughter chromosomes formed from each former bivalent chromosome concentrate at opposite poles, okay? And I'm just gonna erase what I just did just so it doesn't confuse us with the formation of uh, the nucleus, which also does happen in teal phase, by the way, but I'm, I'm not quite at that point yet. All right, so let's change it back to the way it was. So we want the pen tool back on red. Okay, so at these opposite poles of the cell, okay, where we have these daughter chromosomes uh, starting to um, uh, concentrate themselves, um, the daughter chromosomes begin to decondense. They unwind and unwind and unwind, etc. At the same time, the mitotic spindle is deconstructed. So remember, those microtubules can be subtracted from the, or the, the, the microtubule subunits, the tubulin, can be subtracted from the microtubule fibers. So these guys, these microtubules of the mitotic spindle begin to deconstruct themselves. All right. Um, At the same time, as these microtubules begin to uh, deconstruct themselves, a new nuclear envelope forms surrounding the decondensing daughter chromosomes at opposite poles of the cell. All right, so we start to see the formation of new, two new nuclear envelopes. All right, and as I pointed out before when we talked about anaphase, what's over here is completely identical to what's over here. So we have two homologous daughter chromosomes for each type of chromosome, right? Here we have homologous chromosome of maternal origin for number one, homologous chromosome of paternal origin for number one, homologous chromosome of maternal origin for number two, and homologous chromosome of paternal origin for number two. Same thing over here. Homologous chromosome of maternal origin for chromosome number one, um, homologous chromosome of paternal origin for chromosome number one, homologous chromosome of um, uh, uh, paternal origin for chromosome number two, and homologous chromosome of maternal origin for chromosome number two. All right. So in the end, we still have a diploid state of chromosomes, right? Remember this cell only had two types of chromosomes to begin with, okay? Um, and for each type of chromosome, we had homologous chromosomes, therefore it was in the um, diploid state. So within each of these brand new nuclei, we have, or we continue to carry on with the diploid states or diploid numbers of chromosomes. Also, remember how we said that these, uh, uh, the names given to the sister chromatids as soon as they uh, separate to become individual uh, new entities of themselves, we call them daughter chromosomes. So too, we call these new emerging nuclei, all right? We call them daughter nuclei, okay? And the plural right here would be daughter nucleus and daughter nucleus, all right?
So again, within each daughter nucleus, there are 46 different daughter chromosomes with 23 pairs of homologous daughter chromosomes. Therefore, each new daughter nucleus possesses, yes, a diploid state. Keep in mind, however, that each daughter chromosome only possesses one copy of itself. So why is it that there are not two identical copies of DNA for each chromosome? As was the case when we began the cycle of mitosis, well, because those two identical copies of each chromosome took the form of sister chromatids. And what happened to the sister chromatids? They were separated at anaphase. All right. And they were dragged to what became, or they were dragged to opposite sides of the cell to areas which became the two different daughter nuclei. So as a result, each new daughter nucleus contains only one copy of each DNA for each chromosome. However, it still has all 46 chromosomes, including 23 different types of chromosomes for each which we have two homologous chromosomes. All right, so later on in telophase, the cytoplasm uh, and plasma membrane of the cell begins to be pulled apart. This process, by the way, is known as cytokinesis and eventually results in two separate cells surrounding the different daughter nuclei. These two genetically identical cells are now referred to as daughter cells. Each daughter cell is in G1, of, of the G1 phase rather, of um, interface. Okay, their existence is identical to the G1 cell that we initially described at the beginning of this slide, except that there are now two of them. All right, and I, I'm sorry, I referred to this as the initial cell that we started with at the beginning of the slide. This, rather, was the initial cell that we began with at the slide. Any number, or each, either one of these cells, and actually in, in uh, both of these cells will then enter in S phase, all right, when the time is right, and then they will go into G2 phase, and then the onset of mitosis will continue, and the whole process will continue on and on and on and on and on, all right? All right, so look at this. So uh, basically what I'm doing now is I'm showing you that in this diagram, we only show interphase as being a small wedge compared to the entire process of mitosis. But recall that this is not an accurate depiction as far as time is concerned. The vast majority of the time that uh, consumes the life of a cell within the mitotic cell cycle, all right, is spent within interphase, okay? Only a very small fraction of the time that one of these cells within the mitotic cell cycle uh, finds itself is spent within mitosis, all right? And remember, that's what the big overview wheel chart that we reviewed shortly at the beginning of this lecture, but uh, more thoroughly within uh, the first uh, segment lecture of this uh, um, uh, chapter two, part three series. Um, uh, that depiction more accurately showed the time frame so that mitosis only uh, occupied a very small wedge of the entire timeline of the mitotic cell cycle. So again, that's something that I want you to keep in mind, that this diagram, all right, is distorted as far as time goes, just so we could take a close look at all of these specific phases within mitosis. But it's important when we look at this to keep in mind that the vast majority of the time, the cell, the, these cells which are caught in this particular cell cycle um, are spending their time within interphase, okay? Whether it be G1 or G2 or S phase. All right. Well, uh, I think that I'm going to end here and we're gonna break down this lecture into three segments just because I want you to sit back 
and uh, let your brain process this a little bit. Um, and take a little break before we move on to the third segment where we're going to look about, or we're going to look at rather, um, the type of cell division that occurs in that tiny minority fraction of cells within your body uh, known as the um, uh, uh, germ cells. All right, so uh, I'll see you back here uh, whenever you're ready to move on. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.